Hello, I'm Mike Aquilina from the Way of the Fathers podcast. If you're interested in Byzantine history, you already know the names of John Chrysostom, Basil the Great, Macrina the Younger, and Gregory of Nyssa. There were giants on the earth in those days, and today we know them as the fathers and mothers of the church. Twice monthly, on Way of the Fathers, we examine their lives and explore their work. You know as well as I do that we cannot understand the world we live in unless we understand it as the world they helped to shape. So please check us out at catholicculture.org slash wayofthefathers, or simply search for Way of the Fathers in your favorite podcast app. Now back to Robin. Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 201, A Narrow Escape. In our last narrative episode, the Normans invaded the Balkans and captured the city of Dyrrhachium. Alexius Komnenos was defeated in his first battle as emperor, a defeat which cost the empire its last native cavalry divisions. The arrival of a truly professional enemy in Byzantium's western provinces was an existential threat to the empire. The Romans were running out of men, they were running out of money, and the legitimacy of the new ruling coalition was ebbing away. If the elites of the former Bulgarian empire were to throw their weight behind Robert Giscard, there was a very real chance that the empire's borders would contract to the Theodosian walls themselves. As Alexius made his way home in autumn 1081, it was clear that drastic measures had to be taken if he and the empire were to survive. If you think about Alexius's position, a young, inexperienced usurper who'd taken an empire at rock bottom and somehow plumbed new depths, you might well expect to hear that he was assassinated on his return to the capital, or that there were some riots in the streets. The fact that none of that happened owes much to the organisation of the imperial regime, which we discussed in episode 198. Alexius's brother Isaac and his mother were running things in Constantinople and keeping a lid on sedition. The Vasilevs returned home quietly and began raising money in order to rebuild his army. He had to be back out on campaign the following spring, which meant hiring mercenaries, which meant he had to find the cash now. His first step was to debase the empire's coinage still further. His second was to demand contributions from his new extended family. And finally, Komnenos turned to the last untapped source of wealth at his disposal, the church. His daughter Anna defends this decision, claiming that Alexius only took a few items that were no longer being used from the treasure chambers of the palace and the Hagia Sophia. She does admit that his men stripped the gold and silver from the doors of one of the capital's lesser frequented churches. It's difficult for us to know if that was the extent of their pillaging. Either way, the sight of soldiers despoiling churches was enough to cause an uproar, particularly in the church itself. The imperial regime justified their actions on the grounds that canon law allowed the requisitioning of holy items when ransoming captives from an enemy. Isaac went to make this case before a church synod, saying, I am forced to force those whom I do not wish to force while Anna claims that Alexius was more robust on the issue, saying, If the whole country is being taken prisoner, if its cities and Constantinople itself are already in danger of becoming captives, if, then, we, in such a moment of peril, laid our hands on a few objects not really worthy of the name sacred, and used them to secure our freedom, surely, we leave no reasonable excuse to our detractors for charging us. Those detractors were prominent at the time. The bishop Leo of Chalcedon was particularly vocal and insinuated that melting down items decorated with religious figures was tantamount to iconoclasm. 
It was less than a year since Alexius's troops had run wild through the streets of the city. The atmosphere was toxic, and something needed to be done to keep the people on side with the listing new regime. The solution, you might be surprised to hear, was to hold a heresy trial for Michael Pselos's protege, John Italos. As his name suggests, John was from Italy and had come to Constantinople around 1050. He was an enthusiastic pupil of Pselos and eventually succeeded him as head of philosophical instruction at the capital. He favoured Aristotle over Plato, and his application of the philosophical method to theological questions earned him an enthusiastic following amongst his students, but also left him open to charges of heresy. John was a prominent figure at the court of Michael Dukas, who encouraged him to submit a profession of his orthodox faith to the patriarch to clear his name of any suspicion but neither side pursued the matter further until now. The facts are that Italos was charged with heresy, the trial was conducted in the Hagia Sophia, an angry mob broke in during proceedings trying to attack Italos, the emperor had to step in to restore order, took charge of the trial, and condemned him. To avoid execution, John agreed to publicly renounce his heretical beliefs during the Feast of Orthodoxy on the 13th of March, 1082. He was then confined to a monastery. So what was going on here? According to historian Michael Angold, the trial of John Italos was politically motivated to change the conversation in the capital. Alexius himself was facing serious accusations, his defeat at the hands of the Normans did not demonstrate God's favour, and no wonder, now that his men were seen ripping gold decoration off the capital's churches. So Italos was a handy scapegoat to throw to the mob to demonstrate what a real heretic looked like. More than that, though, amongst Italos's pupils were some of the most prominent men in the capital, many of whom would have opposed the Comnenian takeover. The trial had the handy byproduct of discrediting them, including several who now worked in the Hagia Sophia itself. Accusations flew back and forth about how Italos's trial was handled, and Alexius agreed not to put any of John's students on trial in exchange for their cooperation. The palace was flexing its muscles, using its bully pulpit to unnerve those who might speak up against them. What convinces Angold and others that this was all cooked up by the regime is the timing of the trial to coincide with the Feast of Orthodoxy. This was, of course, the church's celebration of the defeat of iconoclasm, and within that service a list of past heresies were read aloud. Now Alexius could add the teachings of John Italos to that register, presenting himself as the protector of orthodoxy. It's an episode that gives us a rare glimpse into the politics of court life and how imperial regimes look to silence opposition through their control of official proceedings. Another indication that this whole business was politically motivated is the fact that secular learning was not suppressed. This would have been a good opportunity to shut down philosophical inquiry, and yet Alexius was proud to be seen as a supporter of the schools, and his own daughter Anna would go on to be a great sponsor of Byzantine commentaries on Aristotle. Back at Dyrrhachium, Robert Giscard was already plotting how to press his advantage against the ailing Romans. As soon as conditions allowed, he moved his army southeast and captured the fortress of Castoria. This is northern Greece, putting the Normans in a good position either to march on Thessalonica or to threaten the fields of Greece themselves, the one area of the empire that had avoided the disasters of the past few decades. But 
it was at this point that Byzantine diplomacy really kicked in. News reached Giscard that a revolt was brewing in Apulia, stirred by promises of Roman gold, and even worse, Henry IV of Germany was on the march south towards Rome. Robert knew that his alliance with the papacy was his most important asset, and so he raced home to put his house in order. Although this didn't alter the military balance of power in the Balkans, it did make a psychological and political difference that was probably key to how the rest of the war played out. Robert's son Bohemond was left in charge, and though he would develop into a big player on the world scene, at this stage he was no more experienced than Alexius, and without his father's fearsome reputation, it would be harder for him to project the same aura of dominance. Scholars speculate, for example, that if Giscard had stayed, the Normans would have gone for the Roman jugular, in this case an attack on Thessalonica. If the empire's second city had fallen, it would have signalled a complete collapse of imperial authority. Instead, Bohemond would remain in the western Balkans, trying to secure his hold over the region. This ended up allowing Alexius valuable time and space to recover from his many setbacks. By May 1082, Komnenos was ready to leave the capital with his patched-up army. He marched west and caught up with Bohemond in central Greece, as the Normans were besieging the city of Ioannina. Komnenos tried to learn from the Battle of Dyrrhachium. He scouted the Normans thoroughly and used his Turkish mercenaries to pepper their camp with arrow fire. But when battle came, the Normans were victorious again. To counter the heavy cavalry charge, Alexius had chariots placed behind his front line. The chariots had protruding spears, and the idea was to roll these towards the charging enemy at the last minute and cause chaos. But Bohemond knew something was going on and avoided the centre of the Byzantine force. His cavalry simply outflanked the enemy and smashed into their sides. This led to fierce fighting on each wing, but eventually the Romans routed and fled the field. Anna notes that some of the survivors of the Battle of Dyrrhachium had defected to Bohemond, which may explain how he was able to read Alexius's tactics so clearly. Despite more damaging casualties, Alexius had to keep fighting. He rallied his army at Thessalonica, gathered what extra recruits he could find, and doggedly marched back out to find Bohemond. There is debate about where the next battle took place, whether it was further south into Greece, or if Bohemond had pushed north towards Ohrid. Either way, the result was the same. This time Alexius placed iron caltrops ahead of his front line. These metal spikes were intended to pierce the hooves of the Norman cavalry and cause a pile-up which could then see their elite knights surrounded and destroyed. But yet again, Bohemond saw through the plan, attacked the flanks, and routed the Romans. The morale of the imperial army was at rock bottom. Anna describes them as being unable to look their enemy in the eye. Alexius was forced to return again to his capital empty-handed. The situation was getting desperate, the Normans were capturing more strategic fortresses, and the constant defeats were heaping pressure on the Vasilefs. Although we should note that none of these defeats led to the kind of casualties that we saw at the Battle of Dyrrhachium. I also couldn't help but laugh when Anna describes Alexius passing his own fleeing men as they made their way home. She says he tried to rally their spirits, but lots of them pretended not to know him. It's meant to be a poignant vignette about tarnished imperial authority, but all I could imagine was a Monty Python-style sketch where Alexius is saying, What are you talking about? I'm the emperor. You were just at the battle with me. And men jogging along the road resolutely saying, I've never heard of you. Despite driving the Romans from the field, Bohemond still did not press on to Thessalonica. Instead, he sent detachments to capture Skopje and Orid. Then he moved south, plundering Edessa and Veria on his way back to Castoria. From there he decided to head for the plain of Thessaly, 
which would have provided better winter quarters for his army, the Normans were slowly gaining control of the Western Balkans. Since the empire's diplomats had enjoyed far more success than their soldiers, Alexius dispatched several to Thessalonica that winter. Official envoys contacted Bohemond to talk peace, while unofficial ones went to visit his sub-commanders and offered them lavish bribes if they'd switch sides. When Bohemond found out he had several men blinded, he was determined to maintain control of his new conquests until his father returned. We're not told if Alexius faced any opposition in the capital that winter, or if he took more of the church's gold. But by the following spring, 1083, he had acquired 7,000 new Turkish mercenaries from Anatolia. He marched them to Thessalonica, where he heard the news that the Normans were besieging Larissa. We haven't talked much about Larissa, but it was the largest city in Byzantine Greece during this period, and it controlled the highway leading south from the Via Ignatia down to Athens and beyond. As was their policy, the Komnenian regime had put a loyal retainer in charge of such a key city. This was Leo Cephalas, who had once been a servant to Alexius's father. His loyalty was beyond reproach, but he sent word to the emperor that if he didn't relieve the city soon, they'd be forced to surrender. Alexius marched his force south carefully, avoiding all contact with the enemy, until he could camp a safe distance from the city. Here he scouted the Normans and the topography as thoroughly as he could before laying his trap. Komnenos had concluded that there was no point in fighting the Normans directly. The only way to defeat them was through stealth. So he ordered the Caesar Melisinos to line up the army, ready for battle, and engage the Normans directly. But, when they attacked, to immediately turn and flee. To enhance the ruse, Alexius's brother Adrianos was to dress in the purple and be stationed in the centre, where Alexius would usually be. The next day, Bohemond walked into the trap. He couldn't believe his luck when the Romans lined up for another beating, and for the fourth time in succession, they routed and he led his men on a merry chase. Once the coast was clear, though, Alexius emerged from the nearby foothills with a squadron of elite cavalry. The emperor charged forward and slaughtered the Normans who'd remained behind. This meant that he was able to sack their camp and destroy their siege works around Larissa. He then ordered his cavalry to pursue the Normans and specifically to aim their arrows at the enemy horses, which were less well protected by armour than their riders. This attack caused enough confusion to scatter the Normans and leave Bohemond struggling to bring his forces back together again. By nightfall, the Normans had managed to coalesce back at Larissa and built a temporary camp. But when morning came, Alexius's Turks assaulted them with arrow fire. Bohemond tried to hold the line for a few hours, but eventually panic spread and men began fleeing north. At last, the Romans had routed the Normans. Alexius headed back to Thessalonica and doubled down on his diplomatic efforts. He sent word to every one of Bohemond's garrison commanders offering them positions in the imperial army if they defected. He encouraged them to demand their full pay from Bohemond for the past three years' service. And if he can't pay you, I will. Without his father's money, Bohemond could not satisfy their demands, and so he reluctantly withdrew to the coast and sailed home. Norman control of the Balkans proved to be far more ephemeral than it had seemed six months earlier. As soon as Bohemond was in retreat, his garrison commanders either surrendered or abandoned their posts. The only position the Normans tried to strenuously fortify was Castoria but with Bohemond out of the way, Alexius marched south and surrounded the fortress. Once again, George Paleologos is given the starring role. The fort was built into some mountains overlooking a lake, 
So George dragged a few ships overland, sailed them over to the other side, and scaled the walls from there. The defenders surrendered as soon as they realized Romans were in the city. By October 1083, only the citadel of Dyrrhachium itself was still in Norman hands. The lower part of the town had been seized by the Venetians again, while Bohemond was busy at Larissa. Alexius could finally return to Constantinople with his head held high. He arranged an official meeting with the church where he promised to begin repayments for the gold he'd taken. He also suppressed a conspiracy that had finally formed against his rule, the first of many. Anna doesn't tell us who was involved beyond the generic statement that it was leading members of the Senate and the great military commanders. He exiled those involved and made a show of his clemency by doing so. The danger from the West hadn't passed, though. Back in Italy, Giscard had put down the Apulians, and by autumn 1084 had seen off King Henry as well. Robert seemed utterly determined to capture a chunk of Byzantium. Again, he committed all his resources to the project, gathering thousands of men and over a hundred ships for another expedition. But since he only departed in late September, the Romans were prepared for his arrival. A combined Roman-Venetian naval force intercepted his fleet as soon as they'd reached the island of Corfu. The Allies twice pushed the Normans back and fully expected to emerge victorious, but the Normans surprised them when they were still at harbour and won a bloody victory, capturing thousands of prisoners. The indomitable Giscard was able to land on the mainland again and set up winter quarters, though as had happened three years earlier, sickness soon spread through his camp. When spring 1085 dawned, Robert sailed south to try and capture the island of Cephalonia, but while there, he developed a fever and died in mid-July. Modern scholars speculate that it might have been malaria. The war was over almost instantly. Giscard's son, Roger, rushed back to Italy to secure his inheritance, and Bohemond would soon follow, sparking civil war amongst the Normans. By late autumn, the garrison at Dyrrhachium also surrendered. It had been a narrow escape, but once again the Romans had survived a serious challenge to their rule. One could argue that the Romans themselves had little to do with it. The Venetians had harassed the Normans at sea, malaria had killed more of their men than Alexius had done, and the most effective troops on land remained the empire's Turkish mercenaries. But that, of course, was the reason Byzantium had survived the centuries. They had the infrastructure to survive crises that would have destroyed other states. They could find ways to raise money, and they could find allies who could save them. What was different about the Norman Wars were how close, physically close, their allies and enemies were becoming. The greatest threats to Constantinople had always had to travel a long way to stand before the Theodosian Walls. Both the Avars in 626 and the Arabs in 717 had to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles, dragging huge amounts of supplies with them. Now, though, the Normans had demonstrated that they were just a few favourable rolls of the dice away from seriously undermining the empire's defences. This heightened vulnerability meant that the Romans invited their allies, the Venetians, to move in even closer to them. The state of the Byzantine navy during this period is a subject of much academic discussion, because our sources are so vague. The fleet who normally guarded the Adriatic was very small, so the Romans would have needed reinforcements anyway, but it was clearly felt that the fleets which guarded the Aegean and Constantinople itself could not be spared, or were in no condition to be sent to Dyrrhachium. So we return to the hard bargain which the Venetians struck in order to be willing to sacrifice their men and material 
in defence of Byzantine provinces. In an official edict, Alexius announced the benefits of this special relationship. The Doge of Venice would be elevated to the rank of Proto-Sebastos, a new court honour with a salary, which placed him about fourth in terms of seniority at court. This honour was also hereditary, unlike any other position in the hierarchy. The Venetian patriarch was to receive honours too, and his churches were to receive annual grants of gold from Byzantium. The Venetians were also gifted a couple of churches and their revenues, including one at Dyrrhachium. They were also given a number of shops, factories, and houses in Constantinople on the Golden Horn, along with three landing stages and their accompanying warehouses for their exclusive use. And then comes the crucial part. From that day forward, all Venetian traders were to be exempt from customs duties and sea taxes throughout the empire. This was a momentous decision. As you probably know, the sack of Constantinople in 1204 AD was achieved largely thanks to Venetian ships, not only bringing the Crusaders to the Bosphorus, but then leading the assault on the city's sea walls. So there is an obvious temptation to draw a line back from that event to Alexius' decision here. But we mustn't do that. From Komnenos's point of view, at this moment, it probably seemed like a fair deal. The Romans had never had to maintain a battle fleet in the Adriatic during the course of this podcast. The cost of it would have been problematic at any time, but in the 1080s, it was impossible. Without Venetian support, Robert Giscard might be sitting on the Byzantine throne instead of Alexius, and without an ongoing commitment from the Venetians, the Normans would be very tempted to try again. We should remember that Alexius had witnessed Roman arms failing repeatedly during his childhood against both the Turks and their own Norman mercenaries. Now he'd been on the receiving end of similar brutal defeats. He was absolutely clear about how difficult it was going to be just to hold the empire together, let alone go on the offensive. So he had to secure his western border against further attack. If that meant sacrificing some trade revenue to achieve that, then so be it. As we discussed way back in episode 119, the Romans never quite came to terms with the value of trade. And in terms of taxation, you can understand why. Because the revenues generated from trade duties paled in comparison to the land tax. Although that, of course, was when the land included all of Anatolia. Alexius must have known that allowing the Venetians such preferential treatment was going to cause problems. But I'm sure he hoped that the empire would recover, and when it needed to, it could rein its allies in. The edict was just that, an edict. It could be altered or revoked. Though, life is rarely that simple, is it? I'm sure some officials pondered the wisdom of making such a groundbreaking decision. Even a massive reduction in taxes, down to a nominal amount, would have kept the Venetians within the traditional framework that governed foreigners operating on Byzantine soil. By wiping away all charges, Alexius paved the way for the Venetians to begin altering other dynamics within Roman life. We'll have to talk about all this in more detail another time, but Venetian merchants now had a huge incentive to trade within the empire, and they came to dominate various sectors of the market. Their ability to undercut all their rivals meant that even Byzantine businesses came to reorganize themselves to suit the Venetians. The Italians would also end up breaking trade prohibitions and establishing permanent colonies for themselves, both obviously against long-established rules. <laughs> 
the sheer amount of money they were making in imperial ports encouraged the state of Venice itself to take a direct interest in Roman politics. After all, they were now a major stakeholder. They were powerful outsiders, now operating on the inside. The Norman threat had seemed so perilous that the Byzantines let the Venetians in the back door, not fully realising the danger that Westerners presented to imperial life. The states of Western Europe, after all, were far more like the Byzantines in terms of organisation and power than any of the Pechenegs, Bulgarians or Serbs who the empire had dealt with for centuries. And by keeping those Westerners at a distance, the Romans had been able to dominate religion, war, and money-making in the eastern Mediterranean. But now things were changing. By moving into the imperial sphere, the Western Europeans were challenging the dogmas that had kept the Romans in the ascendant for so long. For now, though, the Byzantines survive, and some of those old dogmas still hold. Though there had been defections to Giscard's cause, no Bulgarian uprising had delivered the peninsula to him. In the 1080s, men still believed that ultimately Constantinople would prevail, and it was better to wait for an offer from the emperor than to make him your permanent enemy. Next time, we will return to the chaos of Anatolia and developments there, Meanwhile, Alexius will turn his attention to that other menace loose in the Balkans, the Pechenex. Could the emperor's combination of guile and diplomacy bring down the dangerous steppe riders? Come back next time to find out. While you're waiting, why not check out the Way of the Fathers podcast? If you're interested in church history, then I'm sure you'll enjoy this show, but even if you're just interested in Roman culture, I can't tell you how influential Gregory of Nyssa, Basil of Caesarea, and John Chrysostom were to the development of Byzantine thought and language. Visit catholicculture.org or search Way of the Fathers wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>